Well, hello there and welcome to the Business Weekly Show on City TV, your most watched business show in the country. My name is Michael Obodu. Please hit me up on Twitter at mobodu. Yeah, I know I sound a little nasal today, but whatever it takes to bring you all the major business news stories for the week. So if you're ready, let's go. Acquiring the Ghana card came with a lot of hassles, but it looks like it will all pay off soon. The Bank of Ghana recently indicated that it will be the only card for all financial transactions. The Ghana Association of Bankers says it will make it easier to acquire loans in the country. That's really good to hear because the challenges of getting a loan can sometimes be a major problem. Yeah, we were particularly for personal loans, um, uh, that is loans given to individuals. This should help really, really in tracing and tracking of defaulters. Um, the situation that we've had in the past is people take personal loans, they jump from one, one job to the next job, and you are unable to find them where, on their next job. But with this, and it's integrated also to your uh, with your um, SNIT card, uh, it's, it's linked to your tax ID, it is linked to your passport. So it is linked to anything that we, we, we can use to find you. And, and, and above all, it also pins you to a location. So it is for the purposes of loan recovery, I'm sure it will be of immense help, not just for recovery. And because of that, uh, accessibility to loans should be also be improved. Access to loan, if I should put it that way, should also uh, uh, improve given that now we have better ways of knowing the persons we are dealing with. We, sh we, should, we believe that uh, if properly embedded into a um, uh, sanction structure, it should help speed up loan approval and perhaps ultimately may even have an impact on um, um, the lending rate that the bank may charge depending on uh, um, the type of loan that the customer is taking. Let's talk about the e-levy. Even before its approval by Parliament, the Ghana Revenue Authority has begun preparations towards collecting the levy. What signal does this send? Your guess is as good as mine. In the Electronic Transfer Levy Bill 2021, the Ghana Revenue Authority is named as the authorized entity to administer the levy in accordance with the Revenue Administration Act 2016, Act 915. The levy shall also be collected by the GRA as established under the Ghana Revenue Authority Act 2009, Act 791, according to the bill. The document further states that the Commissioner General may issue administrative guidelines as may be required for the efficient and effective implementation of the bill when passed into law. The GRA's preparation towards the passage of the e-levy bill is in line with these provisions made in the bill presented to Parliament in December last year. In the letter signed by the Commissioner General of the Authority, Reverend Dr. Amisha Dai Ousuamua, and cited by City Business News, the Authority has directed its partner, the ARB Apex Bank, to ready itself for the implementation of the levy as soon as the bill is passed into law. The letter further states that the implementation of the bill will be undertaken in three phases. This is to enable the GRA to adequately factor the new tax into its revenue collection regime. In this regard, the authority is already developing a monitoring platform for the full implementation of the levy and will soon invite its partners to collaborate with its technical team for a successful execution. This development comes at a time when the government continues to embark on a sensitization program on the e-levy amidst continuous resistance from different quarters over the implementation of the levy. Recently, there have been several calls for Ghana to head to the International Monetary Fund IMF and abandon the e-levy, but the government maintains the e-levy is a better alternative to a potential return to the Bretton Woods institution. But the CEO of Dalex Finance Limited, Ken Thompson, believes government must re-strategize and raise revenue through a more robust property rate collection system, arguing that while the e-levy will hurt the business environment, financial support from the IMF, on the other hand, will only only worsen Ghana's ailing economy. He made these assertions on City TV's The Point of View program. Potentially, if we're not careful and we try and push this through the way that is being presented, 
you are going to kill a lot of business. Mm. You know, there, there are a lot of, if you take a lot of people that rely on taking small loans through electronics means to fund education, health, business. Mm. There are a lot of people that set up small businesses um, online uh, that they use to support themselves. And these are, you know, nascent um, entrepreneurs, you know, new entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of people that have started savings. For example, we, for example, have a product where we have over 100,000 subscribers uh, where they use a the phone to save. And mm -hmm. the minimum amount you save is uh, one CD. Mm -hmm. So if you're not careful, you're going to kill all that. Mm -hmm. You know, Bernard, you remember a few years ago, I waved a check and said, let's go for property tax. Mm -hmm. let's, let's, let's go for it. You know, let's go for it with a vengeance. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've talked about property tax. Mm -hmm. Set up courts. Mm -hmm. That's it, 24 hours to collect the tax. Mm -hmm. Give the bailiffs additional powers to, uh, to, uh, to, to do investigations on site. Mm -hmm. And that's how you're going to increase it. I mean, set targets for the, for the GRA where it's based on increasing and the number of people that pay tax. The Ghana Revenue Authority might be preparing to start collecting the e-levy, but the Mobile Money Association of Ghana is still bent on resisting it. The group has petitioned the minority in parliament, urging them to resist any attempt to implement the levy. They argue that its implementation will lead to massive job losses. Following the high level of controversy following the electronic transfer levy, an amended rate of 1.5% has been proposed by the finance minister. The original rate in the budget was 1.75% and is to apply to electronic transactions that are more than 100 Ghana CDs on a daily basis. This is in addition to the 1% telcos charge on transactions. According to the budgets, up to 0.25 percentage points of the 1.5% e-transfer levy or 16.7% of the yield from the levy should be used to support road infrastructure developments. 10% of the 0.25 percentage points is to be dedicated to the improvements in public transportation, including the purchase of buses. The minority in parliament, as well as a section of Ghanaians, have strongly resisted the levy, stating it will bring unnecessary hardship onto Ghanaians. Another group to express its disapproval for the levy is the Mobile Money Association of Ghana. They believe its implementation will result in job losses. Presenting the petition on behalf of the association, its General Secretary Evans Otunfo said, governments must reconsider the implementation of the levy. We as a body that directly relates to the industry, upon a careful um, analysis of the whole policy, we have come to the realization that, I mean, there are some ills in the in the implementation of the levy, which it is very important that we draw government's attention to. And of course, the minority also plays a major role in the, in the passage or whatsoever fate of the levy. And so we are here today to give to you our official, you know, assessment of the whole levy. Um, I mean, other envisaged consequences uh, than what we think that government should actually look at then probably before implementing or thinking of any otherwise of the whole policy. Yes, mobile money has become, you know, the major driver of both uh, formal and informal sector. Everybody's now leveraging whatever economic activities to uh, transact using the mobile money uh, platform. And so after our assessment, we have realized that um, there are some about 12 challenges should government continue to pursue the e-levy in its current state or form it will be uh, bringing. We believe strongly millions of young people will be losing their jobs because mobile money agents, we are over 400,000. And so if averagely each agent is employing two people, just multiply and you can imagine the job loss or the potential job loss that um, the levy will impose on us. The government's proposal of the ELV may be from a genuine effort to raise revenue for the country. But for residents of Damango in the Savannah region, it will literally mean taxing their savings. According to them, the lack of adequate banking services in the area leaves most of them with no other option than to save on mobile money. 
They just don't get why the government will tax it anytime you conduct a transaction. Government in the 2022 budget announced its plan to introduce a new tax measure, the electronics transfer levy, to increase its domestic revenue and help deal with teething issues such as unemployment and lack of infrastructure, among others. The levy, which was originally pegged at 1.75 on electronics transactions including mobile money transfers, has been reduced to 1.5 following intense opposition by the public. Whilst Parliament is yet to take a decision whether to pass it or not, government has been sensitizing Ghanaians on the importance and need for the new tax. For the residents of Demango and the West Gonja municipality, the levy, if introduced, will be tantamount to taxing their savings and capital. For Fati Idrusu, who sells fruits in Demango, the levy will increase the cost of doing business. It's not nice for me because I'm sending mm, so with my apple and grapes all the fruits. So when I send it, I have uh, 500. I send 500 and you reduce the, you deduct the money from the 500. So when can I get money, I add it. So that one there is not better for us. According to some of them, the lack of adequate banking services in the area, which is largely rural, means mobile money is the platform on which they save. GCB Bank is the only commercial bank operating in the municipality. Though a credit union has recently been opened in the town, most people here prefer to save on mobile money. They tell City News they can't understand why government want to tax it. It affects us greatly because we rely on only one banking here, which is the commercial bank. And uh, most of the transactions and whatever we have been doing here, most of them be, is based on the mobile money. Even a passenger, if he wants to pick a ticket and he's at the village, he will send to you the mobile money. And when you are taking the mobile money again there, you will be taking your commission from the driver. They will then tax it again there before you claim the, the, the total amount. So mostly it affects us greatly. Frankly, it, it will affect us. Now that they want to tax the mobile money, it will be difficult for us. So many people have been in the mobile money system than the bank. Because the crowd there, you can't, even if you go to bank, it delays you than going to mobile money. Mobile money is up about some five minutes, you are done. And the taxes that now they are bringing there, we don't know what to do, it's very bad. Zalia Mohammed, who operates a non-alcoholic beverage wholesale shop, say she will leave the platform if the levy is approved. Mm, that people that they are that their own, not me, because me, I'm not using it. I prefer to collect my money when you are coming to buy my things. If you buy, give me cash so that I will remove your things from you. That's all. We really are in interesting times. Even though our debt as a country stayed unchanged at 58.2 billion US dollars in September and November last year, Due to the CD losing value against the dollar, the debt in cities has increased by over 3 billion. The November 2021 debt figure of 344.5 billion Ghana cities brings Ghana's debt to gross domestic product GDP ratio to 78.4%, pushing debt to GDP ratio into uncharted territory. This represents an accumulation of about 53 billion Ghana cities within the first 11 months of 2021, following the 299.1 billion Ghana cities recorded at the end of 2020. A look at the data from the central bank shows that year on year, that is, from November 20. 2020 to November 2021, the debt stock rose by about 20% from 287.1 billion Ghana cities to 344.5 billion Ghana cities. 
A further breakdown of the debt numbers shows that the component of the debt secured locally rose marginally by 1.3 billion Ghana cities from 178.1 billion Ghana cities in September to 100. And 79.4 billion Ghana cities in November 2021, which represents 40.8% of the projected GDP for 2021. The external component of the debt stayed at 27.9 billion US dollars in September and in November 2021, but increased in city terms from 163.7 billion Ghana cities to 100 and 65.1 billion Ghana CDs. The surge in the debt in city terms came largely from the about 1% depreciation of the city against the dollar from September to November 2021. The rise in public debt has led to concerns about debt sustainability and the ability of the country to access the international capital market for more support. Ratings agency Fitch recently downgraded Ghana to be negative with a negative outlook following, among other things, a pandemic-related surge in government debt and uncertainty about the government's ability to stabilize debt against the backdrop of tightening global financing conditions. Our growing debt as a country raises a lot of questions about the state of the economy and the options available. The former finance minister, Sir Tekbe, is asking the government to heed to calls by stakeholders to return to the International Monetary Fund, IMF, to finance the country's deficit instead of taxing Ghanaians through the electronic transfers level. Seth Tekbe's remarks come after calls from different stakeholders, including lawmakers who are against the e-levy for the government to run to the International Monetary Fund, IMF, for financial support and policy credibility. Although the government insists on not going back to the IMF, the former finance minister believes the country's problems of being locked out of the international capital markets, among others, will compound in the coming years if government remains adamant and does not take decisive action immediately. He spoke to City TV's Bernard Avle. It is the prerogative of government to say that we want to go. But they are acting on all, all our behalf. Yes, it's sovereign. The sovereignty resides in the people. So if you say you are not going to the IMF, give us, uh, give us your program. For me, that's my simple request. Because the markets don't believe that the budget. You read the Fitch report. The Fitch report is saying that the markets don't believe, you know, that the budget is a solution for us having market assets. Right? So that is the question facing the country now. And I'm saying if we don't, it will only compound in three years the commitment that we have to make. And we have, as we speak now, we have to borrow to do refinancing. And so I see even year levy, not in terms of those systemic structural challenges that we have, because they're in the medium term. I see it as providing the immediate liquidity that is needed. But the reason some of us also are opposed to year levy is that you are taxing service and it's regressive. Meanwhile, the government has reaffirmed its decision not to return to the IMF for support. According to a Deputy Finance Minister, Abnause Asari, the e-levy is a better alternative to a potential return to the IMF. Globally, there are issues everywhere and all countries are trying very hard to find space within themselves to develop. And then you have issues that you want to raise more revenue and you say, I'm shelving that and running to IMS. What happened to homegrown solutions? This is one form that I believe is telling all and sundry that we can do it and we can do it ourselves. Let us come together, support this government to push through the e-levy and we will see the results of the e-levy. The tax measure that we come out with, we review it from time to time. Once we review and then we see where it is going, I believe that the Ghanaians will say that, yes, we came up with a homegrown solution and it's worked for us. Currently, as I speak to you, there are no plans of going to the IMS. The plans we have is a homegrown solution that we are asking all and sundry to help us support us and move this e-levy action and bill forward. Let's turn to fuel. Have you noticed how fuel prices are skyrocketing these past few days? I just can't believe that the average cost of fuel now on the market is about 7 Ghana cities. A lot of factors are influencing the spike, but one of them is the reintroduction of the price stabilization and recovery levy. 
The price stabilization and recovery levy was initially taken off the price buildup of fuel on the 1st of November 2021 for two months, but was later extended till the end of January 2022. The move was to absorb some of the shock on consumers from the frequent increases in prices on the international market. But with this latest announcement from the National Petroleum Authority, fuel prices at the pumps are expected to go up from the 1st of February. This will mean prices are likely to go up by 16 pesos per litre on petrol, 14 pesos per litre on diesel and 14 pesos per kilogram on LPG. Head of pricing at the NPA, Abbas Ibrahim Tasunti, has been speaking on the development. The price stabilization and recovery levy, as you are aware, um, it was removed for a two-month period from the 1st of November 2021 to the 31st of December 2021. Um, a further extension of this removal was done for the month of January. And uh, we communicated this to the industry that it will, be, it will last for another one month, which ends on 31st January 2022. So as we speak, the levies on petrol, diesel and LPG have been off for three months, which expires today, 31st. Um, so per our letter, it is to be restored effective 1st February 2022. The purpose of the price stabilization and recovery levy is to stabilize prices for consumers and pay for the subsidies on premix fuel and residual fuel oil. Mr. Tassonti stated that continuing with the suspension of the levy would hamper the provision of the latter. If we remove it forever, it means they will not have money to pay and then we'll have to look elsewhere. You remember one of the main reasons why price regulation came into being was because of the non-payment of subsidies that are accrued on fuel products and therefore it threatened the supply of these products and therefore we have to make sure that the levy whilst we are used, we used to pay the subsidies it can also be used to stabilize so for the three month period that it has been taken off there has nothing has gone into the account and uh, we've been using what the, the kind of the backlog or the balance in the account over this period to pay for these subsidies as we speak the account is dry so if we remove it forever or we continue to remove um, zero in the levy it means we will not have money and then the, and now the, the subsidy or the supply the continuous supply of premix for and residual oil for oil will be threatened which we don't want that to happen so unfortunately uh, for the consumer we've enjoyed uh, we, it has to come back we've enjoyed the removal for three months but this is the time to bring it back so that we don't have an issue of financial um, challenges for the suppliers of these products well, as usual, our transport operators aren't happy with this development, and I sincerely can empathize with them. Those who fail to commute are feeling the pinch. How much more those who rely on it for their livelihood? This is not the first time that fuel prices have gone up this year. The last time it happened, it incurred the wrath of commercial drivers across the country who embarked on a protest demanding a reduction in the price of fuel. Although most of the drivers took part in the protest, it failed to yield the desired results. The price of fuel went up again on Tuesday and, once again, public transport drivers are unhappy about the development. The NPA explains that the current increment is as a result of the reintroduction of the price stabilization and recovery levy. The levy was suspended last year as part of efforts to cushion consumers from the constant rise in the price of fuel products in the country. However, Leadership of the GPRTU says this increment is not in the interest of their members. The fares that we charge are the same, and yet we are buying more fuel. And so it's affecting us. Sometimes at the close of the day, when you take out the cost of fuel from your sales, you even can't get your daily sales. And if you cannot get your daily sales, and so how do you get your money to your house? So it's really affecting us. But because um, the government has pleaded with us to remain calm until the negotiations are completed, there's nothing we can do. Some of the drivers also accused the government of being insensitive to their plight. First, if I buy 100 cities, I can take and work and close. By now, if I buy 100 cities, unless 200 cities. So by, if you talk, I... It will not go and end anywhere, so we just keep quiet. The uh, GPR to uh, our bosses, you see, they should have to talk about 
about it, but we, when we talk, it doesn't end anywhere. Uh -huh. So we don't know how to do now. Now, it's affecting a lot. If we are talking, uh, the government he didn't listen to us. So, me, Stephen, I didn't beg the government. If you like, if you take the diesel fuel to 100 Ghana, we buy it. Only God will listen to the drivers. Now to private jets. I'm sure you heard all about the Ghana Airport Company Limited instructing Magdana Aviation to suspend its use of Terminal 1 at the Kotoka International Airport for its private jet terminal services. That was literally a bubble buster after all the pomp and pageantry that went into the outdooring of the facility. The management of the Ghana Airports Company Limited, GACL, indefinitely barred Magdan Aviation from operating its private jet services at the Terminal 1 of the Kotoka International Airport on Tuesday. This comes only days after Magdan Aviation launched the private jet terminal and its accompanying services on Friday, January 28. At an event boycotted by the leadership of the Ghana Airports Company Limited and government officials. According to the airport authorities, this was due to operational breaches by Magdan Aviation. Speaking to City Business News, the Deputy General Secretary of the Public Services Workers' Union of the Trade Union Congress, John Sampa, noted that if such situations were unchecked, they could lead to a downgrading of the Kotoka International Airport, which would ultimately affect their livelihoods. What we have seen as workers is that our management wrote a letter to Magdan Company and in the letter you can see clearly that effort for Magdan to sit down with the company to comply with the regulation and lay down procedure have not been followed and for a high authority like our management to cry like that means that somebody an individual is trying to be more powerful than the state and now the airport operates with international standards and greedy. And if we are not very careful and people uh, are allowed to do things haphazardly, it could actually lead to downgrading of the airport. Once it is downgraded, people are going to lose their jobs because a lot of airlines will divert and will not actually land here. What then happens is that some of our members will lose their job. And as a union, anything that is a potential threat to our workers' economic well-being is our concern. Magdan Aviation has since announced the suspension of its private jet operations at Terminal 1 of the Kotoka International Airport to enable the management hold talks with the GACL over contentions regarding operational procedures. Aviation analyst Sean Mendes believes this is the right way to go. Speaking to City Business News, Mr. Mendes added that in future, management of GACL must be proactive in such matters to avoid being flagged by the international body, ICAO. Well, I think the consequences of having a terminal that has not been approved by the airport operator can be quite severe. Uh, you know, there are, there are services in the terminal, whether that's immigration, customs, security in particular, that are very critical because the terminal leads to the same air side where all the other flights are operating from. And there are certain standards that ICAO mandates, that the US TSA mandates and so forth, that have to be maintained at all access points. So if there is something that uh, Ghana Airports Company and Ghana Civil Aviation Authority have not approved within the terminal and people are able to go through the terminal as a result, it could lead to revocation of uh, ICAO authorization and US TSA authorization which in a worst case scenario could mean that international flights could stop until those are corrected. So uh, potentially there is a lot of uh, problems that could come up from an unauthorized terminal, but this is not something that is difficult to fix. And if both sides approach it in good faith, a resolution is there to be had. City TV is live on DSTV. Go to channel 363. On GoTV, access City TV on channel 182.
on a digital TV. Please press the menu button on the remote control and run a new search on your TV. Take note that without an antenna, you cannot access City TV on your television. City TV can be accessed on a free-to-air digital box like the Go TV and Star Times box. City TV, it's your world. Remember in our previous episode, I told you about how we lost over $8 billion due to the undervaluation of gold exports? The government is putting some systems in place to help address this challenge. And it's pleasing to know that it's going to be technology driven. A recent report by the Institute of Statistical, Social and Economic Research says Ghana lost about $8 billion between 2011 and 2017 in taxes due to the undervaluation of gold exports in the country. One way the country can end or minimize this is using proper and approved mechanisms. Key among the measures is the digitization of the assaying of gold which will soon be completed at the National Assaying Center of the Precious Minerals Marketing Company. During a working visit to the Assain Centers of PMMC, the Deputy Minister of Lands and Natural Resources in charge of mining indicated that government will soon complete the digitization of Assain of Gold. I am highly impressed and I must commend the MD for initiating that digitalization process. And as we all witnessed, um, a client comes in and everything uh, basically or technically is done uh, paperless and that is encouraging enough. As you witnessed when we went to PMMC premises, just adjacent to the premises you saw a refinery being built there. I'm told they did a test run uh, in December and very soon His Excellency the President uh, will commission it. Uh, we have LBMA license and then we get it operational. So we've come a long way. We didn't have all this. It's just a matter of producing gold, exporting and touting ourselves as a gold producer, the leading gold producer in Africa. And at least we've gone beyond that. Uh, very soon uh, this year we'll have our refinery and we are encouraging to have more because we have enough to refine here. And we've been talking about the capacity if we build the capacity, uh, why not? We can refine our gold here. Um, investors are only ready to have their returns. And if you are able to show that uh, financial muscle to receive whatever they produce. The managing director of PMMC, Nana Akusi Ewa, indicated that his outfit will do its best to augment government's efforts to end gold smuggling. There was the incidence of gold smuggling and um, I'm happy to say that uh, government through the efforts of the Honorable Deputy Minister and the team at the Ministry uh, were very supportive in dealing with that. And so last year in October, the Honorable Deputy Minister um, inaugurated a gold smuggling task force. Uh, we've had a couple of meetings so far. Uh, very soon we would go into operations, but of course those are details I can't share with you because they are operational matters. Uh, but um, we intend to deal with that forcefully to ensure that all the gold leaving the country comes through the right channels. To some not so exciting news, the Precious Minerals Marketing Company currently has a legacy debt of over 65 million Ghana cities and is calling on the government for support to settle it. The company owes some four banks and the debt have accrued over a 10-year period. There really must be a way to make these state-owned enterprises fully accountable and responsible so they don't come running to the government for bailouts. 
The value of Ghana's 126 state-owned enterprises is at 110 billion Ghana cities, representing approximately 27% of the nation's 2020 gross domestic products. As of the end of 2019, an aggregate net loss of 586.4 million was recorded in the SOEs sector, and this compares to a loss position of 188 in 2018. The precious minerals market company is a state-owned enterprise and it is in the category of the entities under distress. It is servicing a legacy debt of over 65 million Ghana cities. The debt owed some four banks have been accrued over a 10-year period and they are affecting the company. This came to the fore during a presentation of the operations of the company during a working visit by the Deputy Lands and Natural Resources Minister in charge of mining. The Managing Director of PMMC, Nana Akwesi called for government's urgent intervention to avert a crisis. You could see from the presentation, as at 31st December, the total legacy debt was 65.5 million. 65.5 million. Um, when we came since 2017, we've paid a total of about 15.5 million. Indeed, as at 2017 January, it was about 30 million. And we've so far paid about 15.5 million. If that debt amount had stayed at 30 million, what it means is that we would have paid half of it by now. But as you know, it's a debt which continues to attract interest. So although every month we keep paying, um, by the following month, interest has built on it, and then it's like fetching water into a basket. The Deputy Minister of Lands and Natural Resources in charge of mining, George Mirkuduka, said his ministry would liaise with the Finance Minister to find a solution to the problem. Legacy debt has been a worrying you know, trend as far as the operations of this agency is concerned. The MD has tabled it on several fronts to our outfit. And I must say, uh, the first time I visited, he raised the matter and was wondering how he was going to uh, surmount the challenges. Obviously, taking up an entity that has a debt of 30 million is something that we, 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 we must you know, be worried about. Uh, interestingly, with the support of his team, he's been able to pay 15 million out of the 30. The interest rate on the 30 has impacted negatively on the operations of PMMC, and that has resulted, as I speak to you, uh, about 65 million, which is something that we must sit around the table with Ministry of Finance and other stakeholders to hurriedly, you know, find a lasting solution to, to this canker. Otherwise, it will be following mm -hmm. us, and whatever effort that you put up, nobody will see it. Golden Star Resources Wasa Mine has been taken over by Chief Feng Jilong Gold Mining Company. Beyond the acquisition, the Minister for Lands and Natural Resources, Samuel Abu Jinapo, has asked the new owners to list on the Ghana Stock Exchange. He made the announcement at a ceremony at Wasa Achimpe. The 52.89 square kilometer Golden Star Resources Wasa Mine concession was sold to Shenfeng Jilo Gold Mining Company, a Chinese mining firm, after a deal was reached on Friday, 28 January 2022. The official handing over makes it the second mine to be sold out by Golden Star Resources within two years following its earlier sale of Golden Star Bogosu Christia Mine to Future Resources. Speaking at a handing over ceremony at Wasa Achampim in the Western region, the Minister for Lands and Natural Resources said the mine has a lot of potential and thus asked Shinfen Jilo Gold Mining Company to list on the Ghana Stock Exchange to benefit Ghanaians. Needless to point out that the investment and impetus that Shefen Chilong seeks to introduce into this Wasa mine will contribute tremendously to the growth of our national economy. Government has charged Shefen Chilong 
to list on the Ghana Stock Exchange. Shefin. Shefin has also committed to implement the community development agreement entered into with the host communities, as well as support the development of the community mining scheme being implemented by government to promote responsible, sustainable, viable, and environmentally sound small-scale mining in our country. The last minister, while expressing government confidence in the capacity of the new owners, urged them to fulfill all their obligations to workers and the people. As part of the conditions for taking over the mine, Shefin has agreed to respect and honor all existing contracts of Golden Star Resources, including employment contracts and collective bargaining agreements entered into with employees of the mine. Let me assure the workers and the good people of Wasa that government will work with the Shenfin company to ensure that the rights of all employees are protected and where necessary. Appropriate severance packages are paid in accordance with the laws. The board chairman of Shenfin Jilo Gold Mining Company expressed his commitment to work to meet expectations of the government and workers. We have learned that you expectation to introduce higher quality mining investor to Ghana and we witnessed your efforts for the development of the Ghanaian mining industry. We will take the over and carry on this higher standard and good practice. We will also do even more to develop WASA into a world-class mine. We are all important stakeholders of WASA mine. The successful of this mine represents the successful of every one of us. The managing director for the Wasa Mines, Shadrach Ajetesowa, who announced the completion of the takeover deal, spoke about what it means for the mines. Our good work has made us attractive to be acquired by a new owner, Chifen Jilong Gold, who promises to sponsor and support our growth plans of being a multi jurisdictional low cost and a higher production asset. The Secretary of the Ghana Mine Workers Union, Abdul Mum in Ghana, told City News about the union's expectations. In, in fact, in all the engagements that we had with the new owner, and uh, the old owner also witnessed some of those engagements, we, has, we don't expect any loss of jobs at all. We expect a very smooth transition where, I mean, all of them will get an opportunity to work with the business. The Ghana Commodity Exchange is targeting to trade 5,000 metric tons of cashew this year. This is after it piloted trading of cashew last year and sold 1,000 metric tons. Such impressive numbers. Our cashew farmers must be positioning themselves to take advantage of this announcement and cash in big. The Ghana Commodity Exchange, GCX, began operation in 2017 mandated by law to serve as a link between agricultural and commodity producers and buyers gcx has so far listed maize sorghum soybean rice sesame and is working on adding on cashew the introduction of cashew onto the electronic trading platform of gcx will undeniably reap many benefits for ghana's cashew value chain as well as market actors involved in the cashew sector in ghana as GCX operates to support smallholder farmers, develop various agricultural value chains and provide export opportunities for Ghanaian commodities, the exchange organized a reserve trading auction to engage market actors in the cashew value chain. In an interview with City Business News, Chief Operations Officer for the Exchange, Robert Duwona Owu, said it will, in the next cashew crop season, undertake a reserve auction of a minimum of 5,000 metric tons of raw cashew nuts following successful auction sessions last year. In 2021, for example, we piloted the trading of cashew um, through what we call the reserve auction trading system, which is different from the spot trading that we have on the exchange. What is, is, is a system whereby you have a seller bringing in their cashew to be traded on their behalf for them by the exchange, and the exchange lines up and puts together the buyers who bid 
just like you do in a car auction for the commodity and then one is traded they go for the commodity and set up or pay for the commodities that they had um, we managed to do a thousand and fifty metric tons of cashew and that was really good considering that it was at the end of the season and also um, well, it was new to the market um, fast track into 2022 one of the major things that we want to do is to actually do more auction trades on cashew we intend to scale up the volume because we believe that cashew has the potential of you know making um, some good income for the farmers who produce um, those cashew nuts the first auction we did 50 metric tons then the second one we did a thousand metric tons so this year we're looking at something around 5,000 or more so we believe that it's possible to do that um, all things being equal I want to do 10,000 <laughs> if if that that works out um, yes but that's what we want to do in order to achieve these targets, it is important that the cashew sector is sanitized to help improve its yields. The Tree Crop Development Authority says the government is putting measures in place to regulate the sale of seedlings and chemicals in the cashew industry. I'm sure with these in place, we will soon become a cashew hub. The maiden annual conference of the Progressive Cashew Association of Ghana was attended by over 600 cashew farmers across the country and was under the theme beyond traditional cashew farming and export. Government, after announcing the producer price for cashew in December 2021, is taking various steps to regulate the sale of cashew seedlings and chemicals in a sector. The Chief Executive Officer of the Tree Crops Development Authority, William Ajapon Kwetu, while speaking at the maiden annual conference of the Progressive Cashew Association of Ghana in Techimai, threw more light on what is being done to sanitize the system. Whoever is closed with the authority to nest seedlings and sell should be authorized. That is one of the regulations too. Now you see many people going around, you are into cashew, let me use cashew always as an example. You see many people coming around having cashew uh, seedlings and then going out with their bell on it selling cashew seedlings. Very soon it will be a thing of the past. Very, very soon, nobody will be able to go out there and just pull a, a bell on cashew seedlings that we go around, more cashew seedlings or more cashew seedlings. So without authorization, you cannot do that. And you are found to do that, and you have no certification. Of course, you will be arrested. Again, many people go around selling chemicals. I'm sorry, nobody can do that when we have our regulations passed, which is going to go to Parliament, probably this meeting that we have started. Our regulation is almost at the tail end of its preparation. The regulations is supposed to go to the minister sitting here, and then they'll put the carbon note on it to Cabinet. Cabinet will then send it to Parliament for approval. We at Tree Crop Development Authority, with a kind benevolence of IFC and some other development partners have finished with the development of the regulations. The National Treasurer of the Progressive Cashew Association of Ghana, Simon Berko, also urged the members of the association to use their right skills in the discharge of their business. I also want to ensure and want to use this opportunity to express our profound gratitude to the government of Ghana for forming the Tree Crop Development Authority, whose mandate is to ensure the development of the cashew industry. I'm also entreating all our members to follow the accepted standards set out by the government, Ghana Standard Authority, especially the right scaling. Lastly, to the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement. Finally, negotiations on the rules of origin under the agreement have been concluded on after several deliberations. The rules of origin are the criteria needed to determine the national source of a product. And since the agreement is basically to help African countries trade indigenous products amongst themselves, then it is important that there is a consensus on this.
On January 28, 2022, the eighth meeting of the African Continental Free Trade Area Council of Ministers responsible for trade was held in Accra, Ghana. The overall objective of the meeting was to assess the status of negotiations on outstanding issues and agree on the steps towards the start of commercially meaningful trading under the African Continental Free Trade Area. In addition to the progress reports from the Secretary General of the African Continental Free Trade Area Secretariat, Wamkele Mene, the ministers considered a report of senior trade officials who met in Accra from 24th to 27 January 2022. Briefing the media on the outcome of the meeting, Chairperson of the African Union Ministers of Trade, Ibrahim Patel, stated that member states of the African Continental Free Trade Area have agreed that trading under the AFTA regime proceeds on the basis of agreed rules of origin covering 87.7% of total tariff lines. The most significant of it is we've bedded down key rules of origin that allows us now to say with confidence to heads of state that we have a package of products that we can start trading on. Just to recall, in 2019, when the heads of state met, uh, uh, we had already done considerable work. And uh, at the time, we had agreed to something of the order of uh, just over 3,800 products for which there were rules of origin. But there were still a number of ones that had not been agreed. So over the last two years, uh, the negotiators and the ministers have been meeting frequently, as you can see, eight meetings of ministers. Uh, and it's concluded now with a package, a package that has 88% of all products on the tariff books across the continent for which we have agreed rules of origin. In other words, we now have defined for each of them what constitutes the minimum African content, uh, content for that product to be traded between countries on the continent on the basis of preferences. That is a big breakthrough. And uh, I'm happy to say that this two-year period of work uh, that we've undertaken in 2020 and 2021 identified uh, more than 850 additional products. 850 additional products for which rules of origin have been agreed. Secretary General of the African Continental Free Trade Area Secretariat, Wamkele Mene said the conclusion of negotiations on rules of origin was an important milestone towards the successful implementation of the Free Trade Pact. He noted that plans are far advanced to gazette the schedules of tariff concessions in accordance with the applicable national legislations. Well, the first thing that is required is to have the, uh, the legal instrument that will enable the customs authorities to apply the reduced duty. And one of the, um, the areas that we've been working very hard on is to produce uh, that legal instrument. And now that we have 87.7% of rules of origins uh, agreed to, we are now in a position uh, for that legal instrument to have it gazetted at the at national level. So countries are now in a position to apply the rules of origin that we have agreed to, to apply them uh, from a customs uh, uh, point of view. Meanwhile, the Ghana Union of Traders Association has described the announcement of the conclusion of negotiations on the rules of origin under the African Continental Free Trade Area after as the removal of a major hurdle to the agreement. President of Guta, Dr. Joseph Obeng, while welcoming the news, stated that he hoped the list of permissible goods upon the conclusion of rules of origin will be made known soon. Now that is complete. It is very welcome news to us, but then um, it should be well communicated to us. If we say that the, the rules of origin is complete, it doesn't mean anything to us unless the permissible goods, as it is allowed by the rules of origin, is clearly communicated to the trading community. In this vein, um, it is expected that um, the goods that are perm permissible in Ghana 
should be well lined up for um, 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 citizens of other countries to know, as well as other goods and communities that are permissible should also be known from other member countries to countries like Ghana. When this is done, then we are being informed about the goods that we are going to trade with. Uh, in this regard, we are also seeking that the Secretariat find a way to bridge us up um, the trading community with the manufacturers um, in, in the sub-region um, so that we will know um, these um, items that have actually been qualified under the rules of origin. I hate to say this, but this is all time will allow us for this week's edition of the Business Weekly Show here on CTTV. But our website, citybusinessnews.com, has regular business news updates for you. The Business Dashboard also airs every weekday at 10 p.m., which I repeat, the following day at 7 and 10.30 a.m. My name is Michael Obodu. Please hit me up on Twitter at mobodu. Catch you same time next week. Stay safe, stay informed. Bye-bye.